If we look a little more at the principles of the Illuminati, we'll see them as a continuation of the Jesuit order. For example, Adam Weishaupt wrote, If in order to destroy all Christianity, all religion, we have pretended to have the sole true religion, remember that the end justifies the means. Those which we have taken to deliver you, those which we have taken to deliver one day the human race from all religion, are nothing else than a pious fraud which we reserve to unveil one day in the grade of magus or philosopher illuminated. Once again we see that phrase, the end justifies the means. Everything and anything could be perpetrated by an illuminist as long as the end result was the right one, the advancement of a new type of society. This could, and indeed would, involve even violent revolution and the destruction of property, lives and society itself. One of the mottos of the Illuminati was, order out of chaos. The idea was that they'd introduce chaos in the forms of wars, fighting and distrust, and then having created it in the first place, step in to offer their own self-serving solutions which people would clamber to accept. Using the fifth column, a network of spies would be integrated into society to do the job. In these respects, there was virtually no difference between the Jesuit order that Weishaupt had come from and his new society. The only real difference was that the Jesuits had claimed to be a religious order, while the Illuminati conducted their efforts in a deistic or secular guise. We see in the Illuminati the trademark thirst for control that suggests Asherah's presence. The Illuminati didn't care whether people agreed to be ruled by them or not. They saw it as their right, as intellectual superiors to the Muggles, to impose upon the world what was best for it. The Illuminati were, and still are, a people who despise legitimate authority and work tirelessly to usurp it. When they are in a position of weakness, they work towards that end through subterfuge, deception and lies. However, they made no bones of the fact that they fully expected to one day be in a position of power, and when that day came, they would rule tyrannically with intimidation and terror. Their ultimate aim was complete control, and they would go to any lengths to attain it. The whole order works within the trademark hierarchy system as well. Some quotes. The first duty of the reader of this synopsis is to obey the edicts of his Grand Lodge, Right or wrong, his very existence as a mason hangs upon obedience to the powers immediately set above him. Failure in this must infallibly bring down expulsion, which, as a Masonic death, ends all. The one unpardonable crime in a mason is contumacy or disobedience. The first duty of every mason is to obey the mandate of the master. The order must at once be obeyed. Its character and its consequences may be matters of subsequent inquiry. The Masonic rule of obedience is like the nautical imperative, obey orders even if you break owners. Again, just like the Jesuits, right or wrong is unimportant compared to slavish obedience to the hierarchy. Combined with the end justifies the means, there are no moral barriers left between people and the darkest depths of depravity. Superiors would command inferiors to commit a crime, and then, having done it, superiors could blackmail them by threatening to expose their actions. The Jesuits also used confessional booths to blackmail and control kings and queens in this manner. According to a joint deposition signed by Professor Renner and his three colleagues, the object of the first degrees of Illuminism was to train the adepts in the system of espionage. Once the member had so committed himself to such nefarious acts of espionage, treason or other treacherous enterprises, he remained in a state of perpetual dread, fearing his superiors might at some time reveal the criminal activity. Remember how the Jesuits had various methods of suppressing their conscience and avoiding justice that mainly centred on lying, deception of self and others. This also continues in the Illuminati. You must conceal all the crimes of your brother Masons, except murder and treason, and these only at your own option. And should you be summoned as a witness against a brother Mason, be always sure to shield him. Prevaricate, don't tell the whole truth in his case, keep his secrets, forget the most important points. It may be perjury to do this, it is true, but you're keeping your obligations and remember if you live up to your obligations strictly, you'll be free from sin. As for the Asherah or Jezebel trait of intimidation, when a brother reveals any of our great secrets, whenever, for instance, he tells anything about Boaz or Tubal-Cain or Jackin or that awful Mahabone, or even whenever a minister prays in the name of Christ in any of our assemblies, you must always hold yourself in readiness, if called upon, to cut his throat from ear to ear, pull out his tongue by the roots and bury his body at the bottom of some lake or pond. 
Of course, all this must be done in secret, as it was in the case of that notorious man Morgan, for both law and civilization are opposed to such barbarous crimes. But then, you know you must live up to your obligation, and so long as you have sworn to do it, by being very strict and obedient in the matter, you will be free from sin. What I've aimed to do in the last few parts is to show that through Freemasonry, Satan didn't abolish his plans in the Enlightenment. He merely changed tack and perpetuated his mysteries under a deistic or secular guise. The words of Weishaupt explaining the purpose of his order give it away. He said it was for illumination, enlightening the understanding by the sun of reason, which will dispel the clouds of superstition and of prejudice. We haven't seen language like that for a while, but the source of this enlightened understanding is the sun, and we know that the sun represents Baal. So the usual themes are all here. Deception, control, total obedience to the hierarchy, and esoteric knowledge from the sun. In order to conceal the true meaning and nature of their society, Freemasons, like all occultists, make frequent use of symbols to communicate hidden ideas in plain sight. Having come this far in our study, we should now be equipped to decode these symbols when we see them, and so that's what we'll look at next.